So, welcome everybody to a virtual visit to CERN CMS. Um, maybe I quickly introduce once more uh, the team here uh, at, at CMS.5. So next to me is sitting uh, Mohamed. Yes, hello everyone. Then we have uh, our uh, main technical team, the Sultan from Hungary and Noemi as well from Hungary. And, uh, and on the other side, in another room, in a virtual room, uh, with a backdrop of an amazing artwork, is sitting our chair for tonight, this is Mick Store. And I will pass over uh, the, uh, the word to Mick. And while he's talking, I will walk over uh, to the assembly hall because there we will start uh, the story about CMS. Okay, Mick, up to okay. you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Thanks to the guys in CMS, the technical team for this afternoon. In fact, I'm at the opposite side of the ring, the LHC ring, 27 kilometers in circumference, 100 meters below ground. I am sitting quite close to one of the other LHC experiments, which is called ALICE, a large ion collider experiment. But we're not going to talk about ALICE much today. <clears throat> um, there are four big LHC experiments, CMS, ALICE, LHCB, and ATLAS. I just happen to be sitting close to ALICE because this is where I live, okay? Uh, while I'm talking, Michael is making his way from the CMS control room, uh, where you saw him a few minutes ago. That's the control room. That's where the experiment is actually controlled from. And he's probably gone outside, walking through a car park, or maybe he's going inside, inside this very large building. You'll get an idea in a few minutes how large this building is. And he's on his way to the assembly hall. What is the assembly hall? This is where the CMS experiment was assembled, assembled on the surface, uh, completely on the surface and tested on the surface. This is unlike the one of the other big experiments, well, the other two big experiments actually, or the, the other three experiments. Atlas was actually assembled underground they lowered the pieces underground, Atlas, but uh, CMS was actually built and, and uh, tested on the surface, then split into some very large slices. You'll see the very large slices when we go underground and lowered down uh, quite a big hole, actually, and you will be able to see in a few minutes the hole that they were lowered down into. Okay, so Michael is showing us the entrance to the assembly hall. If he can pan up a little bit, he can. You can see how high it is. Okay, this is uh, this is quite a big building. CMS itself is uh, is uh, 15 meters in diameter, so the building has to be at least that big. So this is why it's that big. And now he's pointing to the far end of the building. It's at the far end of the building where CMS was first uh, built. And then it was moved in pieces towards a hole that he's going to show us in a few minutes. And we hope that he's not going to uh, drop anything down the hole. There's actually a, a fence that pre pre yeah. prevents him from doing that. Um, Mick, yes? so uh, maybe I want to, you may also want to mention where we are because we are in the middle of a, a nice landscape on the yeah. countryside, on the French countryside. On what you see at the back side is a nice mountain. It's yeah. called Jura Mountain. A range of and, mountains. Yeah. And if you and this here over there, you may see a peak over there. And this is one of the ski stations, which is very close. So you have ski. Uh, we are Geneva. Geneva is in the in the close to the Western Alps. And of course, uh, with the lake and uh, Chamonix on one side, and at the other side of the lake, there's the Jura. Uh, and we are very close to the Jura mountain. So now yeah. we're entering 
now we're entering the assembly hall. So down the far end there, this is the space. You can't see the space, but uh, at the far end, this is where the CMS experiment was actually constructed right at the beginning and uh, tested and then split into pieces, which we will show you when we go below ground. And uh, the pieces were moved along here and uh, lowered down this big hole that Michael is going to show you in a okay. second. One, 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 one thing what you may want to mention with uh, this was empty when we constructed CMS. And sure. now, of course, this big hole uh, is, is also used as with uh, technical workshops. Okay. And now if I turn around, there is so the, CMS. Yeah, that's- Is it so CMS? That's, that's <laughs> the, you can get an impression of the size of CMS. And this actually fitted in this building. Uh, this is a slice uh, of CMS, real life-size photograph actually of CMS. And the photograph was, uh, taken by Michael and his uh, one of his colleagues, oh. and you might want to think how on earth did he take a high resolution photograph like that? You can actually read the labels on the cables. Not today, but if you got close enough, you could read the labels on the cables. And of course, the answer is it's many photographs which have been photographed, uh, photoshopped together. He he uh, he wrote a a crane, a cherry picker crane, and took many photographs. Yeah. And then they were stitched together to produce this. So this is actually a remarkable, a remarkable photograph. None of the other uh, maybe, experiments maybe. have one of these, actually. Uh, there's, there's, one, uh, there's one comment I want to, when uh, we installed the poster 2012, um, it's, as Mick said, it's a life-size photo, and I was so happy and, uh, and and uh, I told the, the technical coordinator who is responsible for the site here, um, how amazingly it fits in here in the size. And he, he told, turned to me and said, Michael, this building was built <laughs> to fit this in here. <laughs> so it was, a, uh, of course, uh, the life-size photo uh, pass fits in because the real thing, the building is built accordingly to construct this year. So now I, I, I go down and I must not, of course, uh, put the camera over the hole because this is important uh, for, for Pitten. Uh, uh, but there you may see uh, the, the, the hole. Uh, and it's uh, when we operate, there's a, there's a 800, bet, uh, 800 um, ton beton block be below the picture. Concrete. This is then can, which concrete, uh, concrete uh, block, which is closed, will be closed during operation because the the um, the image, so the the hole has to be closed uh, during physics run. Of course, there was a question. Did you see? Uh, well, I mean, I, there there was a question: of how many people did did it take, take to uh, construct take, the CMS? Okay. I mean, uh, there uh, there's uh, I can uh, I can tell you something. I I I, I made a book. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago. Meanwhile, uh, where, where um, I took a lot, uh, took many nice pictures of CMS, but also uh, portraits of our members. And then I, col I, I, I collected all the names who participated in CMS in these uh, twenty years up to then. Um, and there I, I collected eleven thousand names who contributed to work on CMS. So uh, there you see a little bit uh, the, 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 the size of this collaboration over the years. Right now, we are, we are we're having a, a three, between three and 4,000 people uh, working currently on CMS. Okay, so, so two, now, Michael, two interesting numbers there, which we will repeat. 11,000 people have worked uh, on CMS, at least who appeared in the book, and it took 20 years from the uh, first idea to, to build CMS, 20 years to actually build it and get it operational. So now he's moved out 
He's moved out of the assembly hall, still in the same building, and he's walking along a corridor towards uh, a little room where we uh, in welcome visitors. Not so many today because, uh, well, first of all, we don't have visitors today. Uh, um, unfortunately, no visits are allowed to serve at the moment. Maybe they will be opening, in a, op opening up shortly. And that's where we, that little room is where we show them the film that we hope that some of you actually watched before this virtual visit. Because if you've watched that film, you will already know uh, quite a lot of interesting stuff about CMS. But if you didn't watch the film, it's okay. Uh, you can answer, ask us questions as we go along. So why is he coming here? Uh, he's at the other side of the building now, and he's coming around to the place where you can actually get access to go underground. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you're a visitor, uh, you can actually do this, a real visitor, if we were allowing visits. We're not allowing visits at the moment, but uh, many thousands of people have been under. What are the pipes that overhang in the corridor? Ah, well, what are the pipes? The I, I will show you. I will show you downstairs um, even more pipes, because uh, this is a huge cavern. I mean, you have seen the building, uh, the uh, the assembly building from outside, and below ground, hundred meters below ground, we have two times the volume uh, excavated, like they are a surface building. So the experimental cavern is a little bit wider and not as long as the surface building. And the and the and the service cavern is longer, but not as wide. So, but in in principle, uh, you 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 would find two times the volume uh, of the surface building underground. And of course, you need a lot of air and ventilation underground. So these these big pipes are ventilation pipes. So and and here uh, now I uh, I'm I'm a, a, a about to enter, and there are two entrances. You see on one side, this is a, uh, for people, and this is a big one for uh, materials because you have three different ways to get uh, 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 material downstairs. Well, you can carry it and you walk over and pass by here. If it's bigger you to take the elevator, you enter uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, this, the material door, then at this, at this side, here's another shaft, a smaller shaft. We will look up upstairs when we are down. This is for bigger material, which doesn't fit in the lift. And the big, uh, really big equipment, uh, I showed you the big hole, which goes directly down to the experimental cavern. So now I will go through the, through the uh, eye scan. You need to patch. Uh, so access is very strictly controlled. Yes. So what Michael is doing now, he's just shown uh, his, his uh, dosimeter actually to the, to the scanner. It knows who he is. It opens the door. He's now looking into an eye scanner. If the eye scanner recognizes him, the door opens and he's allowed to go in. So if any of you read the book, Angels and Demons, uh, which, uh, said that you could steal the eye of a physicist and uh, get into, into the antimatter factory at CERN, which we do have, by the way, an antimatter factory at CERN. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, actually, a dead eye wouldn't work. But in fact, it was not so wrong. You do re there is an eye scanner here, and there will be another one underground. So it is not easy to get in. So Michael's in the lift. Now, so this is where leave. you would go. This is where you would go if you were coming on a real visit. And he's at level, uh, he's at zero meters at the moment. So he's going to go down to minus what, Michael? Yes, so we, we go to minus. And now we've lost him, actually, because when he's in the lift, uh, this is when he cuts out. So now I have to keep talking. So he's going down approximately 90 meters below ground. There are three levels he can go to. The first level is the level of the top of the experiment. 
okay, top of the experiment. Uh, the second level is the level of the LHC itself, and that's where he's going to get out, uh, I think. <laughs> you, you might get out at the minus one, actually. It looks as though he's going to get out at minus one, but I will... Uh, no, he's keeping going. So then there's the so there's the level of the LHC itself, and then the third level is the bottom of the experiment, or yes. the floor of yes. the experiment. So he's now at minus 87 meters. So he so, made it. Uh, I'm, uh, yes, I made it, and now I'm. Uh, there's one important thing. We just opened the door, and uh, you see, you will see this is um, a very as a safety door which we, we need to have always closed. Why? This is not so important because this is the only way out. Usually in the skyscraper, you say, okay, uh, do not use the lift in case of fire or, or so in here it's, it's different. In behind this door, there's the, uh, the lift shaft is uh, separated up, filled up here, you see that? And it's, and it's uh, put with overpressure. So you have, uh, it's, it's supplied with oxygen and, and you put overpressure in there. That means whatever is uh, going, uh, going on outside, any smoke or any gas, uh, it's, uh, you have to uh, evacuate in front of the lift and then you can wait until the, the fireman can rescue you. So, and now we are, we are entering, we are now in the, in the entering the service cabin. And the service but, but, cabin. By the way, guys, uh, he was telling you that really just to give you, to, to make sure that you know that number one priority at CERN is actually safety. So, uh, Safety, keeping people out from going where they shouldn't go and looking after them when they are working or when they are visiting down below ground. Extremely important, strict safety rules at CERN. Okay, so now he's gone into a room which seems to be full of cables, maybe some electronics. Can we see some electronics and around? He's not in the experimental cavern here. He's Beautiful. outside of the experimental cavern. And if you come to CERN to CMS as a visitor, you can mm. come here when the LHC is running. You can come here when the LHC is running. Okay. So what is it, Michael? What is this room? So what this room, this is a special room, of course. Uh, why do, one question we have, we have to answer is, why do we have two caverns? an experimental cavern and a service cavern, electronic cavern. Yes, uh, Mick already uh, mentioned it because to the an experimental cavern, once you have uh, beam on and collision, of course, you are not allowed. It would be not very healthy to be in this room because, because of very, very harsh radiation environment. And um, and the other thing is what you also have in the, in the cavern is a very strong magnetic field. Neither is, very, neither is very good for electronic nor for your body. That means you want to separate as much, more, as much electronic from uh, this uh, environment. And then of course, it makes you uh, flexible to change ports which do not work uh, correctly, while you have the beam, while you have the physics, physics run. So you don't have to stop everything um, to exchange and repair something. <clears throat> because if CMS would stop the beam to make a change, some change in the experiment, that, mean, that would mean Atlas, Ellis, Ellis and LHCP wouldn't, wouldn't get a beam either. So that this is, of course, uh, an intelli intelligent design uh, to avoid um, uh, downtime and use as efficient as possible this very prestigious beam. 
So what you have here, a lot of uh, electronic, and then one, uh, one, one, one has to know, um, you have, this is all uh, working right now. Um, our our uh, experimental team uh, do tests and they run it. They start to run um, all the equipment already to test and make and, and see if everything uh, runs smooth. Also talking to each other, all the sub detectors have to work together. And there's okay. one thing um, you, you may ask, how much distance you have between the experiment and the electronic, because the data are, are produced uh, close to the uh, interaction point in the center of CMS. And here the, the data is processed. And uh, the, in the mean, the mean distance between the sensor and, and the, the sensor and the uh, electronic ports here is around 120 meters. So, and if you if you calculate the speed of light, and then you have the signal of the uh, produced in the, at the sensors at the center of the experiment, transported 100, 120 meters, you can you can calculate easily how many signals of the uh, events are in the pipeline from the collision from the sensor itself up to the to the electronic because we uh, maybe uh, Mick can uh, tell you a little bit what kind of uh, frequency CMS okay, but, has to make but, pictures and how much uh, or uh, let's say LHC produces collisions okay but before we do that we we have to ask a couple of questions I think and um, I'm going to ask you guys uh i like asking uh, people questions when they come to visit cern so michael said that in the experimental cabin there's radiation and a magnetic field um why do we have a magnetic field at cms this might seem i mean i'm, I'm not testing you in any real way i just want to i just want to check if you the, 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 the magnetic field is really important. We have big magnetic, magnetic fields in the LHC as well. I'm just wondering if you know uh, why we would have a, a magnetic field. To guide the particles for collision. Well, that's what we use magnet, magnets for in the LHC. And in fact, where Michael is standing now, it looks as though he's actually standing in the LHC. Well, this is a photograph. <laughs> uh, and he, if he stands in the right place and he takes a photograph of himself, it looks as though he's standing in the LHC. And of course, lots and lots of visitors do this. And he's standing in front of these blue tubes and they are the LHC dipole magnets. And the dipole magnets are used for guiding the particles around the ring, superconducting dipole magnets. There are other magnets as well. Of course, there are quadrupole focusing magnets, but that's not why we have the magnets at CMS. There's a big superconducting magnet at CMS, the biggest superconducting magnet in the world. Anybody know why there's a superconducting magnet? At, uh, why does CMS have a superconducting magnet? Are they used to generate some current? No, nope. no, they're not used to generate some current. They take a very high current, the superconducting right. magnets. That's why they are, that's why they are um, superconducting. We want to, uh, we want to, uh, then we want to have the highest energy possible particles in the LHC. So to get the highest energy possible particles in a given circumference ring, you have to have a really high magnetic field. A really high magnetic field means a really high current. Really high current means superconducting wire. But why do we have the magnet at, at the CMS? Michael's just gone through the second level of eye scan, by the way. So we can, you can get this far as a visitor, but uh, when you come here, you have to go through another, you have to go through another eye scan and you cannot do this when the LHC is running. You cannot do this. 
Okay. Uh, to counteract the Earth's magnetic field. Well, congratulations to the person who's given that answer because I've guided thousands of people around CERN and nobody, <laughs> nobody has thought of that answer before. That's a first for me, but it's not right. <laughs> I, I like that answer. Really good. Counteract the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll put it on hold for a second because I should have been telling you, uh, I got sidetracked. Michael showed you this famous room. He's been through this famous room, the, the, uh, the service cabin room. And he's told you there's lots of electronics there, there's fiber optics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, and he's doing an important job. But what? is the job that it's actually primarily doing all that electronics. And what it's actually doing is when I have real visitors in the counting room there, I, I have a little bit of a bit of fun with them because I say to them, if you listen very carefully, this electronics is running now and it's actually saying no, 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 maybe. And what does that mean? It's actually saying that there are too many collisions when the LHC is running at CMS. There are lots and lots of collisions, say 40 million collisions per second, but only a few, a few hundred, maybe a thousand are actually interesting. So the first thing that you have to do is to analyze the data really quickly. And some, some of this analysis is done on the detector itself. Uh -huh. Most of it is done in the room that we just passed through uh, and say, no, this interaction is not interesting. We're not going to keep the data. We're gonna throw it away because we can't keep 40 million collisions per second. We have to be selective. And that's what that electronics is doing, actually saying, no, 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 maybe. Okay. So, so and the, now I got one more answer, actually, Michael. Yes. Are there magnets to contract or induce mutual inductance? <laughs> well, this is a this is an interesting answer as well. But the answer is actually quite quite simple. And we always talk about this with school students because it's actually school physics is this. Just like guiding the particles in the ring in the accelerator is actually school physics. Um, if, if Zoltan or somebody can put me on the screen for a few seconds, I am showing you, uh, I'm, uh, we have a special handshake at CERN. We shake hands like this. Okay, and this actually uh, shows something called the Lorentz force, which means that if a charged particle is moving in a direction like this, and it encounters a magnetic field in this direction, it will be moved this way or the other way, depending on its charge. So that's what the magnets in the LHC do. They move it, keep the particles in a circle. At CMS, the magnet actually measures the charge of the charged particles. So if they go one way, they're positive. If they go the other way, they're negative. Of course, there are uh, zero charge particles as well, uh, but we'll talk about those later. And in addition to that, it tells you, this tells you the momentum of the particles, because if you measure the radius of curvature of the track, you get the momentum. And what we're actually trying to do at CMS is to identify and measure the properties of all the particles that are produced in the proton-proton collisions. So here, uh, Zoltan has kindly put up a diagram which shows you uh, at the left-hand side, you see the interaction point in the, in the CMS experiment here, and you see various tracks. Now, uh, the easiest one to look at is, some, is the one that goes all the way out. Uh, this is a track of a muon, a heavy electron, a heavy electron. And now, now you might wonder, why does it 
curve two ways. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, actually, and we can discuss this at the end, because this, this features in the logo of CMS. If you look at the logo of CMS, you'll see the, a track that goes bends in both yeah. directions. This is strange. Why would it bend in both directions? But in any case, you can see particles that bend, and they're being bent by the magnetic field, and they go either one way or the other way. So you immediately measure the charge. And if you measure the radius of the curvature, you can get the momentum. OK, so the top track here is you can see here. Uh, uh, Mick, it, Mick, Mick, yes? uh, can we can we discuss this afterwards? Because I think uh, we have prestigious time now to see okay, fine. the detector first. So maybe okay. uh, Sultan, please switch to my camera again, because now Ladies and gentlemen, behind this door, there is the CMS experiment. So now we are entering uh, the famous ex experimental hole, experimental cavern. You can recognize here you the see, colors. In, you, you see immediately the, the beauty of this amazing science instrument. So, uh, and easy to see that the life-size picture represents this surface of, the, of CMS. And CMS is built in slices. So this is what you see here is the end cap so on the one side and the parallel of the other side. So this is a, a, a poster with the different slides and you see the end caps, which is an, uh, perpendicular to where the chambers are perpendicular to the beam pipe and in parallel, the center part. And this is what it represents here as well. Is there anybody in the cavern, Michael, that we can get an idea of how, what this is? I will scale, find scale. somebody maybe at the other side. Uh, we so will we walk through. Get an idea of the scale. Yes. Well, let Is there anybody on the floor? No? Uh, we'll have a look. There you can see the beam pipe. Look in the middle there. There's a Michael focus. Just show them the beam pipe. Those that's the. the so there you see the, the, the beam pipe in the in the center. And this. And you can show the hole above yes. where everything and, was uh, lowered. So and and one one thing what I wanted to show you there's a, there's a. Here, is a corona. This corona round. This is a magnet. Nick was talking about before. Superconducting superconductive solenoid. Net, superconductive magnet. And CMS is called CMS compact because it's very compact design. Muon is one of the particles. And solenoid is because the magnet is a solenoid. And it's, it's easy to see when we, have, uh, when we operate, the whole, all these elements are shifted close together. And what you see here, these big nodes, fits with a centimeter clearance in this hole. So, and, and this surface here is, is getting in touch with the surface of the, of the ceiling of the tracker at the very Mike, center. Michael, we got a yes. couple of questions. So what's the diameter of the beam pipe? Can you show them with your hand? Well, the, the diameter of the beam pipe here, uh, it, it's conic. Because of um, there's one no, important the, the thing. Diameter, the diameter of the beam pipe is what they're wanting to know. Well, as I said, the, the diameter of the beam pipe is, is, is uh, around four centimeters of the LHC beam pipe. And of course, uh, in the, the, the diameter is changing in, in the center uh, in the cavern because the, the diameter is fixed and, and floating from one uh, side to the other side in the, in the cupboard. 
what you see here is is sliding over the pin pipe. And in the very center, you have around three centimeters, three and a half centimeter pin pipe with um, uh, very with with very special material. And then the rest is aluminium. And then it's it's here it's conic to to keep to keep it also um, straight and and solid. Um, while we are moving this, it's it's floating. And as soon as we are, are keeping it. Uh, 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 stable for him. Then we, of course, support, as you can see here, now there's a support in between. But, <coughs> but from the design, the, the beam, pet, beam pipe uh, is, is like a huge bridge going from one side uh, to the, uh, from the wall of the, of the experimental cavern to the other side. It's very important to, to say at this point that um, the Obviously, the CMS has been opened up. The slices have been opened up, and when it's actually running, everything is squashed together. Everything yeah, okay, goes okay. together. Okay. And also, another thing, another remark is that the pressure in the beam pipe is ten times lower than on the moon. Ten times lower than on the moon is the pressure in the beam pipe. You don't want the protons hitting anything as they go around in the LHC. Okay. So these slices slide together. Actually, they're pulled together. They slide on a on a cushion of air. These big, heavy, heavy uh, slices. You just they just slide on a cushion of air. When building this CMS, what was the first thing that got built? Ah, that's an interesting question. I have no clue, actually. What did you build first? <laughs> Um, maybe Zoltan or Mohammed know what uh, what what was built first. I have no idea. Maybe many things were built in parallel. So Sorry, saying what could, what could was you please repeat the question? We we were a little bit off. <laughs> uh, somebody's asked what when you when they when you started building CMS. What did you build first? I guess. Many things were built in parallel, but was there a, something that you started with first, the tracker yes, or of the? Course. Yeah. Yes, of course. The red, what was the red it? slabs. Ah. The first, the the iron. That's the skeleton. Okay. I still remember. Let me just put that. I still remember when these big wheels were constructed. Yes. Uh, they were so constructed on a Ferris wheel, which was dismantled later. I think. These were the first, but uh, but uh, soon uh, uh, after, I think the end caps were constructed as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, those red uh, those red structures, by the way, they they are the return yoke for the solenoid. So when you have a solenoid, you have to return the magnetic field, and the magnetic field is returned through those uh, that those red ion structures. Now I'm giving you a clue as to why that particle uh, bends two different ways, but I'm not going to tell you the answer just yet. Are there any temperature controls with the CMS? Well, we can ask Sultan again. Are there any temperature controls with the CMS? Clearly this yes is super no. con. <laughs> yes and yes no. Uh, no in that sense that uh, probably the, the question suggests. We do not have a temperature control uh, in the hole. Of course, we do have uh, 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 um, air conditioning, so that's a kind of. But what is more important is the temperature of the subdetectors. And yes, yeah. they have. Some of them are on minus 17 degrees. I think today the, the tracker was called down to minus uh, 17. And also the electronics on, on the detectors uh, is, is also, at least the temperature is measured. And also there is a water cooling or cooling that runs on the detector uh, parts themselves that uh, tries to control the temperature of the electronics. And of course, the superconducting solenoid itself is, is kept at a temperature of 4.2, yeah. 4.2 degrees Kelvin, 4.2 yes, degrees exactly. Kelvin. Kelvin, okay. that's the most important, Kelvin. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, we'll, we're getting some questions, but we I think we're going to keep going. We'll keep those questions well, on the uh, chat. We, we won't yes. try to answer the questions. Michael kindly showed us the hole, by the way. I, I, I would, uh, yes, I, I would like to show you uh, where the, these elements uh, uh, came down. So there, there you see the ground floor. And if I, if I, if I make the go uh, uh, look, look up, there you see again the pipes the ventilation pipes. And then you see at the very end, the, the ceiling of the building we have been in before. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the ceiling of the assembly hall. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there are some red elements here. And this is, what's, uh, this is actually for a fire extinguisher. <laughs> um, and we had a, at the very beginning, when we, they finished to construct the cavern, when the cavern was empty, we had the very first big foam party. <laughs> so they made a test, of course. So they just um, tried to fill up uh, and see if the foam uh, would work. So Hopefully this, this is... was the last as well. Yeah, yes. <laughs> what is that? At, at the very end, maybe we, we have a big phone party with techno music. <laughs> but okay, Michael, is, what, what else can you what else can you show us? Can you show well, us I the, want to show you I want I want to show idea you also, of the land. Give us some yes, idea let, of the me, land. Of, yes, of I, I would like to show you the, the, uh, the slices, what you see here. The, on the where because we, we are we're talking about the slices. That CMS is built out of slices. And there, what you see here, this is one, and here's the ne next one. If I go, then this is a central part. This is the, the central part is always fixed. And there are the million rings, the other, now we're the other side. Here's one slice. And this can be separated. And, and here now we are at the other side. So it's symmetrical. You have, we're showing you two end caps there with slices in, in the middle. And of course, remember, all of this is put together when the experiment is running, okay? CMS is a very nice design from a technical point of view, maintenance point of view, because you can pull it apart. Uh, the other experiments, it's a little bit more difficult to pull them apart. Atlas certainly is very difficult. Uh, to get access into uh, the center of Atlas. Of course, it can be done, but, but CMS has this nice design, pull the wheels apart, they float on a cushion of air. Okay, so now uh, we, we, I walk along to the, to the staircase, and then I will, we will walk down, all the way down to the ground floor of the experiment. Watch again, and you, you will see how uh, symmetric both sides of the experiment is. So we're now. Notice that there are just a few cables, actually, uh, <laughs> there. Somebody once told me how what is the total distance of cables and the CMS detector? And I must admit that I've forgotten. Maybe Zoltan or Mohammed can tell us what is the total distance of cabling used at CMS? No, we, we never calculated them, but uh, I think if we would put them one after the other, very probably this would uh, go around the, the globe. <laughs> yeah. I guess so easily. In fact, I think it, we, can, it can cover the pyramids. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. And all the uh, 
all the cables they have different functions by the way they have different colors and the different colors mean uh, they're they're doing they have a different function um, I, I think the blue ones are fiber optic zoltan can correct me and okay. he can tell me what the other cables are well, uh, uh, we have light blue for, for uh, the, the fiber optics uh, almost everywhere and yellow. Uh, but of course, um, the color is very important. The red is always high voltage. And apart from these three things I mentioned, every subdetector has its own color. Uh -huh. The moon is blue, for example. Okay. So you see a blue cable in this cable chain that goes to the muon system. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not completely wrong, I think the green is for tracker. Of course, you won't see it from here. And the white is, uh, is the colorimetry. OK, Michael, where are you? Oh, now I'm on the way down. And I wanted to show you something, because we are we, downstairs we will see that we move, that we move the, uh, the elements, the big elements. And of course, one, what we do not do is unplug and plug all the sensors, then that's why they stay pl uh, plugged in. If, if, even if you move them uh, 10, me 10, uh, 10 meters. So and what you see here is a cable tray, elastic cable tray, which moves all around and keeps the cable and, and, the, uh, and the, two the two wheels connected. Mm -hmm. if, if they are apart or uh, together. And then the same thing is down here in, in the ground. You have below ground, this is uh, here in, this, in the center. And over there, these are, these are uh, metal bars, iron, iron bars, where below there, there's a cable tray. And, and this cable tray just is connected, connecting the, the, the central part with the, with the end cap. So we take out the iron bar when we move the whole thing. And now we go down and I will show you what kind of technology we are using to move because these big pieces, as Sultan said, the red is iron. You can imagine this is not, this is pretty heavy. Something like 14,000 tons, isn't it, uh, CMS? Somebody can correct me. It's smaller than Atlas, but it's much, much, much heavier. By the way, I'm getting the impression, maybe I, our friends in the States might be getting the impression that we're not doing physics here. We, this is a masterpiece in engineering, actually. Well, yeah, it's correct, it's 14,000. 14,000 tons, yeah. yeah it's it's uh, twice as the Eiffel Tower. You can, uh, twice twice as, heavy. as the Atlas. And the Atlas. <laughs> yeah, twice as heavy as Atlas. But Atlas is bigger. Atlas is 20 meters in diameter and 40 meters long, approximately. Yeah. Okay. We are more complex. And if you would put a cling foil around, it would float on the water. <laughs> Atlas would. CMS yeah, yeah, would yeah. Not, not CMS would sink. CMS would sink. So now Michael's on the ground floor, minus so, level level no, no. minus three. Yes. So now I'm on the ground floor, as you can see. Thanks. You and uh, if I if I now go up again, the view up. Okay. Again, the, the view hole. of the, the hole. hole. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, guys, if you have questions, you can, you can type them into the uh, chat. Otherwise, you might forget them. We might not answer sure. them now because we've only got five minutes or so left for the, for the visual part of the visit. Maybe we can do a bit longer. But uh, we, will, we will actually um, answer the questions. They're kept there's, in the there's, chat. There's one, there's one um, important thing you may, you may have realized already. Um, the beauty of CMS is definitely uh, aesthetics. And the aesthetics is, of course, um, linked to how you put things in place. And of course, CMS has a, um, the founding part of the CMS have decided <laughs> a certain color code, like uh, Sultan mentioned before, 
what kind of uh, color we are using for what kind of um, uh, equipment. And there you see it, it, it follows also the functionality of the different uh, elements. And, and one thing you, uh, you see as well, if, you, if I go close, how the cables are put. There, there's no, what I want to mention here is there's no centimeter we are allowed to waste. All the cables are very uh, clever, rooted and placed because you may, you may uh, understand that if you have particle collisions but, uh, and the particles you want to measure goes through material, it makes a difference if there are cables or not. And then you need to, of course, put everything in, in, in uh, having a lot of cables and a lot of pipes in a very uh, uh, small space. You have to be really, very, very um, careful that you put everything such that it fits in here. If, if you make a mess, the, it would never fit in this, in, the, in this space. And now I'm at the, at the bottom, very close to the end cap. This is the plug I showed you before. And, and the plug is actually exactly on top of me. And this plug, as I said, may enter in the VEC tank fit in here. This yellow platform is installed temporarily now here because last week we installed the silicon pixel detector, which is a very heart of the CMS detector experiment at the very center, just very close around the beam pipe. Okay, Michael, I think it's, uh, you've given us a fantastic uh, view of CMS. Um, we have a bit more than half an hour left to talk a little bit about how CMS functions, what sort of uh, things we're trying to do with it. We try to answer some of the questions that you've typed into the chat. You can type in more questions. You can try to answer my question, <laughs> my questions as well. And uh, everybody is free to, uh, to, 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 to take over now and start typing, mm -hmm. or we can answer yeah. some of them already. So we say a big, are you, well, are you, let, are you let, okay? Let, to yes, go? I, you want, I, you don't, let, you don't want to go. You don't want to go. No, no, I don't want to go. Of course. He's, he's so that, excited. He's so excited. He's Michael. He's got to show you something else. What's he going to show us? No, What's he gonna I, show I'd, us? Like, I'd like to, sh I'd like to show you while I'm leaving. First of all, don't miss these views <laughs> because this is exceptional. Uh, you are very lucky that you uh, booked this visit right now because in two weeks time, we will start to move this and close it and then and prepare it for physics run. Then it will look different. Now it's really uh, showing its all beauty. And, uh, but another thing, I want to give you another input for the discussion because I will quickly show you also another, another layer <coughs> of the experiment, which is, which, just, uh, uh, which is just below. Okay, I show you. No, no it's just there. No. Okay, so I show you the uh, the if below ground. There is a. So we are, uh, there's another layer of, of the experiment, which is just be, uh, below the experiment. And there, there's, there you see the cable tray, which is a uh, flexible cable tray, which is buried below. There you see the, uh, what, the uh, this is what I was talking before. This is the iron bar, and this is these are disconnected. So this is moves, as you can see, this moves with this wheel. And then, before I leave the experimental hall, 
I want to show you how do we move these wheels. Because Mick will, uh, Mick will uh, explain you in a, in a minute how we move this, uh, this element, this element with a big nose, which is all, there's also a, a, a color meter included. It's pretty heavy. This has 1,200 tons, just this layer. And this is, this is one of the feats, how to move this. Uh, yeah, we already commented on this, Michael. It's, we, they use compressed air. They just lift it up like a hovercraft and they just pull it, basically. So it, can, it floats on, on compressed air. All of the wheels float on compressed air. An ingenious solution to a difficult problem. Okay. And now I'm will I will leave uh, the experimental I mean, experimental cavern. I'll give you one more <laughs> view on the on the on the uh, staircases on the three different levels. We 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 have been up there at the beginning, and now we're on the ground level. So these are the different staircases to access the equipment on the side. And here we're leaving the experimental cavern again. Okay, thanks very much for the tour, Michael. Uh, we hope you get back okay, and we'll see you yes. in the control room, okay? Okay, okay so, so we'll, we'll see you up there. Okay, this will take him five minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. So, um, okay, we got some questions in the, in the, in the chat. Um, was some of the detector building outsourced to partner institutions? Well, the simple answer to that is that uh, the whole of the building of the CMS detector was outsourced to the participating institutions. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't built only by CERN. Okay, maybe Zoltan can uh, tell us how many participating institutions there are in CMS and typically um, where were the bits and pieces, actually how many different bit places built some of the, these bits and pieces. Exactly. Uh, so Mick, you, you told it correctly. So the, the, we, we reversed the question. So it is not outsourced. It is like a party when everybody brings something, some food for the party. We have more than 150 institutes all around the globe, not only uh, CERN member states, but even, even more. It, 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 these are rather institutes, universities and research institutes who participate uh, in, in, this, in this big challenge. Some of them are, are producing electronics, for the subdetectors, some of them are producing subdetectors, some of them uh, are doing analysis, uh, some of them uh, buy something from the local industry and, and puts it in. Uh, you probably saw, I, I don't know, but you probably saw the, the big iron slabs came from Pakistan and, and Germany, for example, the Muon uh, end cap chambers that uh, Mickey just just shown, uh, they are American and, and Russian uh, institutes. So we are all in, we are all in. Uh, I'm also from an institute, we, we participated in the Muon alignment and, and we brought that in. So everybody brings something just like for a party. Okay, so where do particles come into the beam pipe? Okay, this is- I don't hear you. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I think okay. we can hear you. The, okay. the visitors can. Okay, so where do the particles come into the beam pipe? Well, actually a long way from, from CMS. Uh, the, the particle, well, where do we get the particles from, by the way? This is just another very, very simple question. This is just to get you to interact with me a little bit. Um, we're talking about colliding protons. Where do we get the protons from, guys? Just type it into the chat if you know. Um, do we call Amazon and say, please send us a box of protons? 
Where do we get them from? It's the same for Atlas. It's the same for any of the, the big experiments. Can anybody tell so me where? It, Mick, I've me... also, I put it into our, our Slack so that the students that are within the classroom can give me an answer and I'll put some of those into the chat. Okay, I'm waiting for some through ionizing neutral particles. Okay, yes, that's a good answer, but let's be really specific about this. If you wanted to get a box of protons, aha, what about from hydrogen in the air? Ooh, in the air, <laughs> that would be, yeah, you'd have to do a lot of ionizing uh, there, but uh, you can actually just ring up, maybe not Amazon, but certainly carbon gas, you can send, uh, uh, from <laughs> Earth's core of space. Those are imaginative answers. No, you can ring up Carbagas or uh, Air Liquide or something like some company like this and say, please send us a bottle of liquid hydrogen. And they will send you a bottle. It's about the size of a small CO2 uh, fire extinguisher. No bigger than that, actually. There's a lot of uh, hydrogen atoms in a bottle that big. And all you have to do is you have to uh, separate the uh, proton and the electron. The hydrogen atom is simplest atom. It's made of a proton and an electron. You ionize it, pull them apart, throw away the electron, and then you start to accelerate the proton. So the next question, you can guess what my next question is. Um, how do you make a proton move? How do you make a proton move? Uh, Mick? Yes? The, um, I, I, walking by here, uh, I'm already at the surface, and we have one in, very interesting installation next to the control room, as okay. you, everyone can, can see, yeah. um, which is CMS, as you can read it from far. But if you look closer, this is made. A small fraction of, of the collaborators in CMS. Yes. In CMS. Exactly. exactly. So, and there, this somehow shows you also the, the, the diversity of people who are imp uh, important to construct to construct all this, uh, where's, where, where are you? Where's the sorry, come. Uh, <laughs> uh, and if you look closer here, there you may see two guys you have you mentioned, uh, you have seen already. This Sultan and Noemi, <laughs> and even and if you if you look uh, close here, then you may find me. Uh, where am I? <laughs> He can't remember where he put himself. But this, uh, remember, yes. remember, guys, this is a very, 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 <laughs> this is a long time ago, that photograph. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is only a very small fraction of the 11,000 people. Okay. Uh, this is only a very small fraction. So let's go back to the one answer to getting the proton to move is to take advantage of its charge. Yes, absolutely correct. Okay, so I, I like to play games with, uh, with students when they, school students when they come to CERN and I say to them, I'm a donkey. Okay, how do you make a donkey move? How do you make a donkey move, guys? Well, some of them say you kick it or you whip it. And I say, that's not very kind, but if you stick some food in front of it, then it will go, stick a carrot in front of it. So the big question is, what is the carrot for a proton? What is the carrot? And of course, you can put something behind it, which will make it run away from it. What is the thing that you put behind it? You can put a lion behind the donkey. So let's be specific. What's the carrot for a proton? What is the lion for a proton? You were not expecting. Carrot is electrons or let's say an electric field, a negative electric field. Proton has a positive charge. If you show it a negative electric field, it will be pulled towards it, okay? Uh, so behind it, what would you put?
what would you put behind? Uh, a positive electric field. Yeah, you can push it with a positive electric field. So we somewhere hidden on the CERN site, which is not hidden, you can you used to be able to go and almost see it actually, if you come to CERN. We have the bottle of hydrogen. We ionize the uh, the the hydrogen, separate the electron and the and the proton, let the electrons uh, go away. And then we show the proton negative electric field. And we keep showing it this negative electric field. It gets accelerated down something called a linear accelerator. This is a, in a straight line. And then it goes into a whole series of circular accelerators before it gets to the LHC. OK. Uh, why do you need several accelerators? Because you can't take a, a proton from zero up to uh, high energy, uh, 6.5 tera electron volts in a single machine. You need, it's like you go through the gears in a car and we, we have the gears at CERN because we're 60 years old, more, and we use accelerators actually that have been running, one of them has been running since 1959. And when, as Zoltan says, the uh, and CMS will be closed and they start running again. That machine is critical for the operation of the accelerator complex. It's called the uh, um, proton synchrotron, uh, the PS. Okay, so that's how we that's how we accelerate. We've shown how we bend and measure the particles with mag magnets. So electric fields accelerate, magnetic fields deviate deviate. In the LHC, we don't pull the protons, we actually push them. But this is just a detail. Every time they go round, they get a kick, they get pushed oh, round the ring. Okay. So that's the answer to that question. Have you got any more questions before we go on? There, there are a couple of, there was one from earlier, and then there's yeah. one that's popped up just recently. Uh, the one from earlier was, uh, um, how long are the, the actual experimental runs? Could you tell us about that? Uh, you know, when you're acquiring data for CMS? And then there was one that just came in and said, uh, the electrons that get thrown away when you're creating the protons, do those electrons get reused for anything at all? Okay, answer to the second question, no. They, they just effectively disappear, okay? So an, an experimental run, depends what you mean, actually. The LHC runs about nine months per year, okay? It runs continuously for nine months a year. And uh, then there's three months of maintenance. But then each year, this data gets added. So Zoltan or Mohammed can tell you, uh, Typically, uh, the, the, um, the Higgs boson was discovered after about three years of running for the, for the LHC. So typically, uh, I guess uh, you could say a run lasts a number of years, okay? So they're in a downtime at the moment. The LHC is switched off. It's undergoing maintenance and upgrade. Uh, and they will be starting what they call, I believe, you can correct me guys, run three soon, where soon is a sort of a floating, uh, a floating date, okay? <laughs> run three soon. Okay, do local residents ever experience power issues? Well, let's, let's go back a little bit on this one. Where do we get the power from? Okay, where do we get the power from at CERN? I think it's something like when everything is running, uh, something like 170 megawatts of power is used at CERN. Um, where do we get it from? Do we have a special nuclear power station at CERN? Mohammed, do we have a nuclear power station, Zoltan? Uh, no, <laughs> we, are, we are just consumers in the French network. So- okay. We, 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 we don't eat too much power indeed. So this is something like uh, 170, 180 megawatt. If everything is on, the accelerators, the 
the cranes, my computer on my desktop, together with my lamp, uh, we, we, we eat up something like uh, a power that is uh, uh, needed for a 200,000 inhabitants city. Mm. So this is not too much. Uh, we get the power from the French network directly. We are one of the three French consumers who get the 400 kilovolt on site. Okay. So that means actually, um, when I make a cup of Zoltan or Mohammed make a cup of coffee in the morning, they're using the same power source as the LHC. Now, some of you might say, hmm, that sounds a bit tricky, this, because um, even the French network goes down. It's pretty secure as a French network. By the way, why do we use the French network? Because they've got a lot of power. They have a lot of nuclear power uh do the french okay so they have they're oversupplied with electricity but the electricity does go down what happens if the lhc is um is full of particles full of particles if there's more than two thousand bunches of particles flying around in the lhc in each direction by the way each the the beam is not continuous it's 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 uh, it contained, it has bunches separated by 25 nanoseconds. And in each bunch, there are 100 billion protons. Okay. So at CMS, every 25 nanoseconds, 100 billion protons meet 100 billion protons. Now, the big question for you guys what happens? when 100 billion protons meets 100 billion protons. By the way, the cross-section is the cross-section of a human hair. So we take a human hair, another human hair, and we make them collide. As you can see, I've done this demonstration for CERN many times, okay? Uh, Me too. <laughs> so, so what happens if 100 billion protons meet 100 billion protons every 25 nanoseconds? So somebody said, do all those particles actually collide? So you're actually answering the question there, almost, because the answer is no way. Most of them miss. Most of them miss. Why? Because protons are really, 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 really tiny guys. They're uh, 10 to the minus 15 meters, uh, okay, in cross section. And uh, so they just go through, but enough of them do collide to make it a big deal for the experiments to try to sort out what actually happens when they collide. So you can get overlapping collisions of 50 of uh, beam crossing or something like this. When the LHC switches on again, this will be an even bigger problem uh, than it is today. So you have to have extremely sophisticated electronics, extremely sophisticated software, that's trying to sort out this mess that is being kindly shown to us right now, okay? Uh, so that's the story. Now, can I come back to the chat? Can I have the chat again so I can see what we were doing in the chat? I don't see the chat. So do they actually collide, okay? So the power, so I was asking about the power. What happens if the power goes down? You've got these 100 billion, every 25 nanosecond going round. What would happen, by the way, if you stuck your head in the beam? This is not a silly question, actually, because not at CERN, I repeat, not at CERN, but some years ago at uh, Serpukov, which was a Russian uh, sister or brother laboratory, Somebody actually did this. What happened? I think the guy is still alive, mm -hmm. but he has a hole in his head. Well, uh, no, <laughs> not a hole, not in this, this kind. But <laughs> what the guy said, that he, he uh, suddenly saw billions of stars shining in his head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there we go. So, well, why am I telling well, not you this? Not recommended, is, not recommended, not recommended. No. What I'm, why, why I'm telling you this is that you absolutely do not 
want to lose the particle beams because they will simply punch a hole in this uh, five billion dollar uh, accelerator. So you do not want to do this. And uh, so how do you avoid how do you avoid doing this? Well, you have to have be con constantly, constantly sensing the current in the in the grid. And if you detect uh, that the, the current has gone down, in actual fact, you have three turns around the ring, three turns to kick the particles out safely down a, uh, an external beam line and dump them in a graphite block, which gets very, very, very hot, uh, but doesn't actually melt. Okay, so this is a really, really important feature. It's one of the security features of the LHC. Uh, it, the, it would also destroy CMS as well if the if the particles got deviated into CMS. Okay, so that's where the power comes from. By the way, the power is about the power which is used by the industrial part of Geneva. So Zoltan was saying 200,000 people. It's Geneva is a significant fraction of the power that is used by Geneva itself. Okay, some more questions. When the LHC is running, are all the experiments, CMS, Atlas, Alice, and LHCB collecting data at the same time, guys? Mohammed, are they all running at the same time? Mm, yeah, the beam is running, but mm -hmm. the collision yes. is having at uh each point cms or atlas or lcb with the like uh, configuring this with the H experiment who yeah. will get the collision no the the answer is that they're all running yes. yeah they're yeah. all they're actually all running um sometimes uh, there are conditions when they will say okay we we're not ready but uh, you carry on guys but essentially because what happens to the particles 100 billion meet 100 billion most of them miss what happens to the others? Well, you send them round again, and again, and again, and again. And a typical run will be something like 12 or 15 hours. Okay, so you fill the LHC with particles from your famous hydrogen bottle. You send them in opposite directions. You accelerate them to the energy of 6.5 TeV. You call CMS, Atlas, Alice, LHCB, are you ready, guys? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay, put the beams into crossing at the uh, at the experiments, and you start data taking. And typically, if all goes well, you continue for 15 hours, and then you will throw away because there will still be many, many particles in the LHC. You throw them away, and you use the same mechanism to throw them away that is used if there is a power failure. So you are constantly checking that this fail-safe mechanism is actually working, okay? That's, that's how it works. What are the biggest challenges to running CMS? I have no idea. You guys who actually sit in the control room can tell me what is what is the biggest challenge in running CMS? May I have an ask the answer? <laughs> <laughs> to to convince the 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 decision takers to give us money. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, but they gave you they gave you money and uh, they gave you a lot of money and uh, it's running. On a on a if you start up a run, Zoltan, what is the what is the most tricky bit of starting up a run at CMS? I, I, don't, I personally don't know the answer to this. Actually, actually to keep running is 120 million individual data channels in sync and to give data to the data acquisition system such a way that nothing fails. This is a big challenge. And this is this happens at the at the beginning of every run that the mm -hmm. the data acquisition guy here next to me yeah uh is nervous and uh, tries to start it up of course this is a very sophisticated system it starts much more than that it fails but 
it is always uh, a tricky and and hard stuff to start it up and then keep it running. Yeah, that's why okay. we have here in the control room several people to be sure that the, the data is taking um, good quality. Exactly. Like, uh, yeah, we have here like a full shift crew when the team is turning on. We have the shift leader and we have a guy, certain guy. Stop, 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 stop. This is a good question. <laughs> stop, stop. I didn't say anything. <laughs> this is a good question that we can ask the guys. Okay. How, how many people? Do you think we'll be sitting in this control room where Michael and Mohammed and Zoltan and Noemi are on Sunday night at three o'clock in the morning when the LHC is running and CMS is taking data? How many people do you think will be sitting in that room controlling this beast which is called CMS? Somebody make a guess. Ten, three. Okay, your guesses are good. How many is it in reality, Sultan? Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> so who are they? Who, who so, are they? Five. Mohammed? So yeah, we have five people sitting in the control room. So the first one is shift leader, who's like uh, operating and managing the captain. all the. Sorry. The captain. Yeah, the captain of the the, the ship. Yes. <laughs> so managing all the shift crew. And we have a certain guy who's like looking at the data and see if the data in good quality or not. And another guy who is taking care about the trigger when you explain this, when you have the many collisions. So you have a certain filters, two, two stage of filters. So he's looking for that the trigger is uh, triggering correctly or not. And with, uh, if we have a, like a high rate or not. And we have the most important guy of the shift crew, as Zoltan was explaining, that the DAG shifter, which is uh, responsible for start the, the, the collision. So he has like, a, yeah, as Naomi was uh, showing right now, he has like a green button. Once he hit this button, he start the collision between the protons. So all the same is responsible <laughs> by this guy. And uh, we have at the end many screens and uh, as for sure you know the safety is most important thing for CERN so we have a special guy uh, responsible for the safety and uh, monitoring <laughs> all the safety and you can see all the screens is related to the safety. so you can imagine one guy just <laughs> responsible for all this screen together Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We've got a really cool question, which I'm just going to uh, follow up on that one for a minute. We're, we're going to come back to this one about joining CMS. At the same time, of course, you have a number of people who are running the Atlas experiment, a number of people who are running the Alice experiment, a number of people running LHCB. <clears throat> You've also got the accelerator control room. Now, in the accelerator control room, these guys there, they control all the CERN accelerators, which means they control the uh, ionizing of the hydrogen gas, they control the first accelerator, the second accelerator, the third accelerator, the fourth accelerator, and the LHC, okay? So at three o'clock in the morning, their control room is much bigger, by the way. It's much bigger than uh, CMS's. CMS's control room is quite, small, quite frugal compared to the LHC or the accelerator control room. Three o'clock in the morning, how many people do you think are sitting there controlling the complete full CERN accelerator complex? Two thousand. <laughs> Nice guess. <laughs> nice guess. The room's not that big. <laughs> a hundred. Well, actually, in the control room, it's a pity we can't show you a photograph of it. Uh, there are actually four. Ah, we can. There are four islands. Thank you, Zoltan. There are four islands. And what you're looking at here is in the back left-hand corner, you're looking at the first accelerators control room, the LINAC and the proton synchrotron and something else, okay? Um, 
in the foreground left hand side this is the super proton synchrotron this is the uh, area this is the accelerator which injects into the lhc the back right hand corner this is technical support this is all ventilation heating cryogenics and all this sort of stuff it's not accelerators per se and on the right hand side this is the LHC control room. Now you've taken, they've taken this photograph when there's quite a lot of people there. It's, uh, I don't know what they're actually doing. There's a lot of people in, in the room. At three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, there will be one, two people in each of the islands. So minimum of four and a maximum of eight people running the whole accelerator complex okay who are they uh, you might these guys tend to be engineers uh, they tend to be engineers some of them they're the technic the technicians they're engineers they're physicists they're particle physicists they're accelerator physicists there there's a spectrum of uh, of people in this room okay uh, at any one time there'll be one shift leader in there generally he will not be having a specific task he will just be uh, taking decisions and things like that. they have an interesting they have an interesting button i don't know whether we can zoom in and see the famous red switch on the lhc uh they have a on one of the no, on the, oh, you I'm can't afraid, see i'm afraid we can't see Okay, but on, on that circle, about every meter, two meters around that circle, uh, there is a just a small box, which is a red switch. And that red switch, if you flick that red switch, you dump the beams from the LHC. And dumping the beams with that switch uh, operates that famous fail-safe mechanism, which gets triggered if the power goes down. Well, we have such a button here as yeah, well. You, you have a button there as well. Yeah. But that's, that's a, you have a button that can dump the beams from the LHC. Yes. 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 Okay. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Amy, can you show it? The dump button. Beam, beam, dump. beam dump. Yes, she is going to show in a sack. Okay, let's have a look. There's an interesting story behind this, which I will tell you in a minute, if she can show us the beam dump. Ah, beam we abort. call it beam abort. Okay, it's not the same red switch as they have. Oh, you are very professional. Look, they they have this switch behind the cover. <clears throat> In the LEC control room, this little red switch. It is really a switch. Uh, it's not a button. It's just a switch. And if you have your folder open on your desk, if you are one of the accelerator operators, you could accidentally flick that switch and dump the beams from the LHC. You could actually do that. Nothing would happen. It would, the beams would, would be dumped safely. The physicists at CMS Alice and LHCB and Atlas would get upset, of course, because they'd have to wait for the accelerator to be filled again. But the story behind this is that I once had the great honor and privilege to take Buzz Aldrin into the LHC control room. And they were in the LHC, there were pilot beams. And the, the guy who was in charge said to Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon, we want to get rid of the beam in the LHC. Please come and flick this red switch and look at these two white spots, which indicate that there is beam in the clockwise and the anti-clockwise direction. And he said, sure. And he was wearing his Apollo jacket and his Apollo tie. And he walked up and he flicked the switch and the two spots disappeared. And he turned around to me and he said, Mick, at NASA, we would put cover, a cover on those switches. <laughs> May I have a story why do we have a cover on these Wait a minute, buttons? just one, one, one second, well, just, just one second. And at, after this incident, I thought, why did he say this? And somebody then told me that actually, when he was sitting in the lunar landing module on the moon, he was the guy who had to start the engines to get off the moon and rejoin my, Michael Collins. 
when he tried to start the engines, when he tried to flick the switch, he broke it. He broke it. Fortunately, he was a well-trained astronaut and he had a pen, space pen in his space suit. And he flicked the switch with his space pen. But he clearly had been having nightmares about this. And every time he sees an unprotected important switch, he says, you should put a cover on it. You should put a cover on it. Why not at CERN? Because that switch is used all the time. So, and it's an important safety switch. Zoltan, your story. So you might see that there, there are covers on these two switches. Actually, these are two switches. One is the beam abort we have already seen, and the other is the injection inhibit button, which is to be pushed at a very specific point of the, the, the acceleration. This is to protect our detector. This, this happens everywhere. But if you are about to push this button three o'clock in the morning on Sunday, the shift, leader, shift leader's hand might move in a wrong direction. I was witnessing it, uh, was sitting at, the, at the, the, the desk where we have lots of monitors, and I just kicked his hand away. <laughs> and since then, we have a cover on these, these buttons to wake you up and yeah. to make you think what you want to push. Okay, Buzz, Ald Buzz Aldrin would be very proud of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Casey, yes, you're absolutely right. We've run over time. Sorry to keep you for so long. Thank you very much <laughs> for your questions. Thank you to Michael for, and Noemi for the amazing tour. Thank you to Mohammed and Zoltan. Zoltan for technical support, Mohammed for answering some of the questions as well. Um, we hope we can continue our collaboration in some way with, uh, with you guys. We'd be very happy to do so. Um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we, we stopped recording. Yes, we stopped recording and we... Uh, maybe, uh, wait, 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 one more. Yeah. Uh, everybody is still around. Um, yes. If, uh, if everybody could switch on uh, the camera for a moment, we may, oh, want, yes. we may want to make one uh, group picture. Yeah, so those of you that are, are scholars, if you don't mind switching on your camera for a picture, that would be, it'd be really awesome. It would be cool, yes, thank, thank you. I will try to remove everybody from the spotlight and, and make or let the- Maybe you have to make Valerie. Hey, Latoya and Everett. And Caduce. <laughs> hello, hello. <Yeah. laughs> oh, like I like it. Uh, so we'll, hmm? first, I like it. So we'll, uh, we'll we'll send you we'll send you uh, we'll send you the, uh, a group picture. Okay. Great. Thank you. That'll be awesome. Uh, so that just an announcement for everybody. Um, actually, later in the summer, we're gonna meet some CMS scientists that work at Princeton. Uh, you know, through one of our other programs. So, um, you know they all had mentioned that CMS is a big collaboration with a lot of institutions uh, and Princeton is one of them. And on our campus visit, you'll actually, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll meet one or two of them. So ask, 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 ask our colleague uh, important questions. You just uh, learned now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, quiz, we'll quiz them. <laughs> okay. Casey, thank you for organizing and setting this up for us. We, okay. we really appreciate it. This has been a pretty unique experience for us. Uh, I don't care about the scholars. I had fun myself, and that's <laughs> that's not totally okay. true. I, I do care about them. Okay. 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 Take so, care, you guys. Photo done. Yep. Of okay. Course. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.